Shut up and sit down. Good evening everyone, it's your man of the hour, the Tower of Power, the living legend of professional wrestling punditry. Hello, my name is Lee Hazel and this is the Steel Chair Shot where we stare into the abyss between what WWE fans want from a wrestling product and everything that WWE actually puts out this week. Well, once again, it's a pretty positive turn of events for WWE as they continue with the plan to march forward into this new era and promote the talent. Uh, the collection of new stars that they've accumulated from the four corners of the wrestling world. And they did it with a pretty bloody decent pay-per-view with uh, everyone seems to be happy with social media or the commenters on the internet. Me, I'm really quite happy with this one. Which is surprising because going into Backlash, it seemed pretty clear that this was going to be an almost dictionary definition of B-Show. In fact, the quality of the PPV shining through means that the lackluster build-up for this show is even more of a crime. I honestly have no idea what they were doing in the build-up to Backlash. In the first brand extension of your pay-per-view proper since uh, the brand split, you're trying to convince us that we need to watch two of these things a month, plus the NXT takeovers, plus any other network exclusive you've got in the pipeline. Well, you're not going to do that with a lackluster card that deprives the show of three of the hottest talents that are already on a thin roster. John Cena is out promoting the brand in Asia, and American Alpha, one of the hottest new tag teams in years, have been deliberately written off of the show for story reasons, which boggles my mind. How do you cut off two of your biggest up-and-comers from a show that is set to be the standard bearer for your new pay-per-view structure? And the fact that the wrestlers on the SmackDown roster have only been given two weeks to develop these storylines and mature these feuds only intensifies the feeling that Backlash has been thrown to the wolves by creative. Well, if that's the case, it's been up to the wrestlers to step up and save it. And in doing so, things have worked out rather well for a blue brand. The fact that there were only a handful of matches meant that every single one of them had the time to tell a story properly using nothing but in-ring techniques. They seem to be taking a cue from NXT and they've started simplifying their storytelling and characters, and the wrestlers are being given more freedom to pace a match and perform how they want to. Look at the women's six-pack match for the brand new SmackDown Women's title. Firstly, do my eyes deceive me, or did the women get more than three minutes to work their match on Sunday? Also, you get an entrance, you get an entrance, you get an entrance, everyone gets an entrance. All of the competitors in a six-person match actually got the respect they deserve. Instead of being herded out to the ring like a pack of confused and disappointed cattle, they all got proper entrances too. No one was halfway down the ramp when the next person's music hit, so you don't get that awkward piling up of bodies in front of the ring and no one scurrying through the ropes to take their place on the canvas by the time the bell rings. It was a bloody good match too. They were working the multi-person match technique of throwing everyone else out of the ring until two are left, so we got this constantly revolving door of one-on-one -on -one confrontations, almost like having 12 little matches in one. Just like with the entrances, they all got the space to express themselves properly. For some of these girls, it was their first first chance in a new era for them to really showcase what they can do with their brand new gimmicks. The action was good, some of it great, some of the double teams and uh, oh, Becky Lynch in the ending, like she really looked like the champion. She got a real nice showcase of what she can do before they finally put the belt on her, which in itself was fantastic. Her post-match interview was, was great and it was obvious that, that all of her words came from the heart. Contrast that with, with the gobbledygook that they've been shoveling into Roman Reigns' mouth for the last 18 months. And the difference is clear. Hopefully this is a sign that WWE are uh, let, letting go of their strangled grip of their talent's mic time, allowing them to say what they want instead of feeding them straight lines. But the only thing I'm left unclear about is where she goes from here. Carmella and Nikki have a thing going on. Uh, Carmella surprised Nikki with a pin, continuing their rivalry, but Becky doesn't seem to have an opponent. The obvious choice, of course, is Natalia, but they feuded so much in the past few months, I can't see this as anything other than going over old ground. Also, I would really like to see Natalia pick up the belt at some point, and I can't see that happening right now if she starts going off with Becky right away. Next up was the Usos taking on the Hype Brothers in what must surely be one of the matches where I looked at it on the card and thought if I didn't have to create content for this, I'd probably just skip out Backlash entirely. I mean, you know, one of the reasons why I think that is because they left out American Alpha on this pay-per-view card. And, and there are two spots for them. There are two tag team matches. There are two places you could have put American Alpha. And instead, you put in the Usos and the Hype Brothers. And one of them is going to have to appear twice. I mean, how do you leave one of SmackDown's absolute best tag team off of this card entirely? Well, when you've got guys like Heath Slate and Rhino in pole position to take the brand new tag belts. You know, and, and it's not too difficult to book them in into the pay-per-view either. I mean, okay, right. 
tell you this, the Usos still uh, turn heel against them at SmackDown, but they don't injure Chad Gable. Instead, you have American Alpha go against Heath Slater and Rhino, and you have the losers of the semi-final, the Usos and the Hyatt Brothers, fight for the right to face them at no mercy. Now, the Usos win that match, but during the final for the belts, the Usos interfere and cost American Alpha that one. Hey presto, Heath Slater is tag champion, he gets to work on SmackDown, he gets to feed his infinitely rising number of children, and the Usos still retain their heat, and your paying customers still get to see the best tag team in WWE today. That is a win-win. But, all things considered, the way the guys handled the matches that they were given was probably the best we could have hoped for. The Hype Brothers provided uh, the Usos with some real tough physical babyface competition. In the past, I've accused the Hype Brothers of being like uh, a soundboard that a fat guy sat on. You know, they're just a collection of noises and catchphrases that the kids find hilarious. But here they showed real talent, real character, and real ability. The Usos, however, are really uh, coming into their own with this new attitude. Uh, they come out sounds paint, they're wearing black, one of them, I don't know which one's which, god help me without the paint, it's even harder to tell them apart. But one of them is, is sporting a beard now, and their look has, has changed dramatically, they look like real no shit given gangsters. And every expression they make, every gesture, every movement supports this new change, which is really important when you're trying to repackage yourself in, in front of an audience. Uh, they even won with uh, Conan's old submission, the Tequila Sunrise just to give him that sour little cherry on top. I'm just a little worried about the timing of this new heel turn. Um, in NXT, Samoa Joe is no longer the champion, meaning that he's probably wrapping up his time with that brand. So if he winds up on SmackDown as a heel, with a couple of low-level gangsters of the same ethnicity as him to be his cronies, I'm kind of just hoping that WWE resist the temptation to do the obvious and offensive thing that they've been doing for years now, where they corral a bunch of people the same race together because they think that that's all they need to make a, uh, to make a compelling heel faction. It'd be far too predictable, a waste of all the talent involved, and quite frankly, I think, as a company and as a society, surely we're all past this. As for Heath and Rhino, I'm glad WWE put a button on this one. The Sign Slater movement was fun for a while, but taking it past this would have been milking a cow dry and out of Blumpio's wit. WWE have been known to take a popular joke well past the point at which it stopped being funny if they thought they could get a few bucks out of it. So I'm glad they let this one rest in its prime. Now, just before we talk about Miz vs. Ziggler, I want to talk about uh, the pre-show match between Baron Corbin and Apollo Crews because I think there are some similarities between the two. Firstly, thank you WWE for only putting on one low stakes match before the show itself because my time is precious. Secondly, thank you for giving a good amount of time to these two guys who are clearly trying to prove uh, their worth in a system that's clearly leaving them behind. They went out and they had a really fun physical match where they really tried to showcase what they could do. Now, if that's what happens when two rookie year underappreciated WWE athletes are asked to prove themselves in the ring, the Intercontinental match is what happens when two veterans do the same. Yes, okay, it's weird to think of Ziggler and the Miz as veterans, but after a combined quarter of a century in the business together, that's exactly what they both are. Both men pulled out all of the moves and all of the stops in this match. They, they were using moves and techniques that I can only imagine that their bookers won't usually sign off on because it just doesn't represent the WWE brand. But by loosening the definition of that specific style of wrestling, uh, the wrestlers have been allowed to broaden their horizons and add more styles to their repertoire. Ziggler, for example, got to show off more of his match skills, the one he honed at Kent State University that earned him so many amateur wrestling championships. Miz, too, brought out a side of him that we haven't seen before. His use of submissions, especially the ones that he was using to go Daniel Bryan, made him look like a much more accomplished wrestler than the one we used to see. It's like Dolph and Miz have been awoken from comas and killed off the imposters who have been playing them for the last three years. Although, no matter how much Miz has improved recently, if this Daniel Bryan baiting is going to result in Daniel Bryan coming out of retirement, to kick the Miz's ass, I've got to be honest, on the list of wrestlers I'd like to see Bryan come back for, the Miz is close to the bottom. I mean, he makes the list, but, you know, only just barely. Next, we've got the Bray Wyatt match, and once again, no matter how much of an excuse WWE get given, they cannot give him a win. At this point, I'm starting to think that they're doing it on principle. It's almost been going on for so long now, it's done out of sheer tradition. Randy Orton can't participate in the match because of concussion-related injuries. Gee, I wonder where he got that. So they have to find Bray a replacement. Now, this is a great way for Bray to get a win over a hastily drawn up opponent. 
He's probably going to lose to Orton to keep Orton sweet after agreeing to a hard way juice job which is fancy talk for Brock Lesnar digging a castle moat into his forehead. But as the only build superstar on the card in this match, WWE had an opportunity to add a little petrol to the fire Bray always ignites under the asses of his fans. Instead, they poured sand over it. Again. Even worse was the fact that they fed him to Kane. Okay, you know, I, I get what they're trying to do. They thought that if he kicks out of a choke slam, which he does, it will make him look strong. But WWE overestimate the legacy of that move. Back in the late 90s, Kane laid waste to opponent after opponent. Oh, uh, with that move taking down the likes of Stone Cold, Triple H, and The Undertaker. But it isn't 1997 anymore. If Kane hasn't been the force to beat for some time now, and I don't think he's posed that kind of a threat in, in over a decade. Bray losing to him, no matter the circumstances, just makes him look weak. And once again, they take the best talker in WWE, and they've reduced his words to meaningless mumbles. And nowhere, nowhere in WWE, nowhere in all of wrestling, is there such a gulf between bad booking and a great character as there is between WWE and Bray Wyatt. Okay, but, you know, on to happier things. Like... AJ Styles in his first ever WWE World Title match. <laughs> this was fucking amazing. The title match it didn't start off great. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah, you know, it's just not an instant classic. But the fact that it didn't start off great meant that I never saw the title change coming. It, it didn't feel like a match where the title was going to change hands. It, that made it even more of a surprise. Some of the spots were were big, high risks like you'd expect, but some of them were just beautifully simple. Dean crashing AJ's head into the mat to get out of the car crusher was a particular favourite. He just grabs the guy's soccer mom hair and just like slams his face into the mat over and over. I think you could see the sweat stains from uh, where, 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 where uh, uh, AJ's forehead just kept bashing, bashing into the wood. You know, and uh, you know, apart from that, there's not really much to say about this one. You know, Dean never really had a good run with the belt, but then again he was never given that much of a chance. You know, Ambrose vs Ziggler at SummerSlam never really felt like it was main event material, or even championship material, especially with Ziggler putting on a much better performance at Backlash than he did at SummerSlam. AJ winning though is a moment for the ages. This man has defined every promotion he has been a major player in. ROH, TNA, New Japan, uh, it was one of the reasons WWE didn't touch him for so long because he was inseparable from the promotions that he had already been in. But, but now, he is the latest champion in a batch of wrestlers that WWE can claim that they've molded, but they can't say that they made. WWE are finally letting go of the control that have hobbled them as a creative force for so long. Backlash is emblematic of the new direction that WWE are taking. We've seen wrestlers take back control of their gimmicks, their wrestling styles, and their personalities. We've seen WWE's ego reigned in a bit, and in doing so, letting their product flourish in a way that it hasn't been allowed to in a long, long time. This is a promise for the future, and we'll have to watch Raw's Clash of Champions to see if this sentiment goes company-wide. Well, there you have it, folks. That was a steel chest shot. Um, thank you all for listening once again to uh, all of my ramblings, and please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment if you agree or if you disagree. Oh, and check out the mag below, and I'll catch you all on social media. Thank you.